Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is the final lesson in a series on the Holy Spirit and spirituality. This is lesson is a kind of a summary of many of the important things from this series of lessons. And it's entitled, The Work of the Holy Spirit. It's lesson number 12 in this series for March 25 of 20. 17. Let's begin with a word of prayer and ask that same Holy Spirit to guide us as we seek to understand these very important teachings. Our wonderful Father, we don't know how to thank you enough for giving us the Holy Spirit to guide us in our understanding, to help us to understand your words and your teachings, to illuminate the life of Jesus for us and to help us to become more like him. We ask now as we delve into these matters more carefully and, and, and more thoroughly, that we may be imbued with the Holy Spirit and those who are watching and listening may be blessed more than they have been before is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you probably figured out by now, we've discussed many aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit during this quarter. And many of those things really are based on what uh, Jesus said in John 16. And we're going to focus today particularly on John 16, verses 8 to 11. And I'm quoting from my Good News Bible. And when he comes, this is Jesus promising the Holy Spirit, and when he comes, he will prove to the people of the world that they are wrong about sin, and about what is right, and about God's judgment. They are wrong about sin because they do not believe in me. They are wrong about what is right because I am going to the Father and you will not see me anymore. And they are wrong about judgment because the ruler of this world has already been judged. That should settle it, shouldn't it? Well, the Holy Spirit has been sent to be a parakletos. Now we're getting really fancy here with our Greek. What's a parakletos? Well, the word in, word in Greek means a helper, a comforter, an advocate. One of the very earliest uses of the word parakletos was that there were, there were helpers and, and, and medics, kind of medic people who do various kinds of things that would stand behind the phalanx of Greek soldiers that would attack the enemy. And these people would be there with their spears and so forth, but if one of them got injured and fell behind, these guys would rush up and try to take care of them. So that's a parakletos. Literally, para means beside or basically beside. Kletos, kaleo, means to call. So one called up to help the person who's been, uh, who've been, who's been knocked down or, or um, injured. So as you think about the, Holy, the work of the Holy Spirit, does he intercede with God and attempt to change God's opinion about us? Or does he intercede with us to change our opinion about God? Yes, Certainly God one. knows us. He doesn't knows need to frame. change his opinion about us? He, kn he knows our frame that we are but dust, and Jesus said, uh, knew what was in the heart of man, so God knows. Well, one of the interesting things is that in John 1, tw John, 1 John I'm sorry, 2, verse 1, it says, I'm writing this to you, my dear children, so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have someone who pleads with the Father on our behalf, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, and although that needs to be taken in context, the expression pleads with the Father on our behalf is a parakletos. So Jesus is a parakletos as well as the Holy Spirit. So we mustn't make the mistake of saying it's only the Holy Spirit that's there. Well, does this mean that um, the Holy Spirit is called to be, um, to carry on the same work that Jesus did? Is that what's implied? It's interesting that when it says, I'm going to send another spirit, the word is alos, which in Greek means another one of exactly the same kind. Well, in this lesson, we will also discuss the assurance of salvation, what guarantees that assurance. So those are the things we really want to focus on. So what are the implications of saying that the Holy Spirit Following the example of Jesus is our helper, comforter, parakletos, and friend. 
does the Holy Spirit come to say, you better straighten up? Well, it's a connector. It's a connector to God. It's connected okay. to the truth. It's connected to the, to the thing that kind of um, makes you get drawn to the truth. Mm -hmm. He lifts up Jesus. When he lifts up Jesus, and when he's lift, Jesus said, "When I'm lifted up, I will draw men." Is, to is that for the purpose of condemning us because we don't look like Jesus, or is it the purpose of drawing us? The purpose of of uh, seeing, uh, by contrast, we'll see our own need. The first okay. beatitude is that uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Unless yeah. we see our our spiritual poverty, we uh, mm -hmm. we will. Uh, it's it's very try interesting. To take yeah. Sure. Try to take control of our li lives, okay. and we'll just thrash about. But we need to see in Him the the source of all life, the words of life. Here's what's incredible about the life of Jesus: He was the only one, the only human being living on this earth ever, who was perfectly sinless. And yet he was re he w he repelled the saints, and he attracted the sinners. That's the, how does that work? Well, the saints had their own form of sin. They sinned <laughs> yeah, differently. of course. They yeah. didn't see their need. Yeah. That's, that's the difference. And, and the saints didn't have the truth. And mm -hmm. he was the truth. And that <coughs> attracts people who are looking for it. And obviously the saints are not looking for it because they think yeah. they have it. Yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately, in, especially in the past, we have sometimes given the impre impression that we need to go to sinners and tell them what kind of terrible sinners they are so they can reform. Is that the way it's supposed to work? No, just show them the truth. Yeah. As Jesus did. Mm -hmm. it has what about what? meeting their needs, yeah. doing good? It has never been our responsibility, we've mentioned this before, it has never been our responsibility to judge any other person. We can judge what they say, it's, um, it's, that's a very important thing. We, we, we need to be discerning and careful, but we, we, that doesn't give us the right to judge the person himself. By the way, how does the judgment work? Is, is, is it necessary for Mary and the saints and Jesus and the Holy Spirit to be pleading with the Father? Because <coughs> the Father is pretty reluctant to forgive us. I see no. some people no. shaking their heads. No. How does the judgment work? Well, look at a very interesting verse. It's found in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 22, and it says, Nor does the Father himself judge anyone. He has given his Son the full right to judge. So if Jesus is the one that's pleading for us, he's the parakletos, how can he also be the judge? Does that make sense? So then we go to John. Yeah, by the way, it was the same person who wrote both of those verses. Yes. We go to John twelve forty eight. Yeah, I was getting there. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you, you've got it. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, you're fine. Just, just a little bit ahead of me. Look at John twelve forty seven and forty eight. Let's do that right now. If anyone hears my message and does not obey it, I will not judge him. This is Jesus talking now. Again, I came not to judge the world, but to save it. Those who reject me and do not accept my message have one who will judge them. Okay, now we're going to find out who the judge is. The words I have spoken will be their judge on the last day. And the words are God's teaching. The With biggest the, example of that is that Jesus walked the earth 2,000 years ago and spoke words to communicate the truth about the Father. And uh, back to Hebrews 1, many in various ways God spoke to, through the prophets and so forth. But now he did it by his son. Many, in, yeah, many expressions of the Father down through the ages. And if you go back to John chapter 3, we, we love John 3.16. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But we need to stop. We need to keep reading. Look at John 17 to 21. Right. For God did not send his son into the world to be its judge but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. Now that's what we need to know, right? This is how the judgment works. 
The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show what, that what they did was in obedience to God. So the spirit of truth, if people are not looking for it, what's the net effect? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it also says that they love, they right. don't love the truth, they love lies. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. love lies, that's, that may be what the judgment's all about, is to figure out if they love lies or not. If they love lies, what else can you do? We I don't mean, need a very sophisticated judge with a big court and a lot, a lot of jury to figure out the fine points of whether you know, we're doing what's right or not. The question is, do we love the truth or do, do we love the lie? And John twelve forty eight, the words he has spoken are, excuse, excuse me, take that back, it's John uh, 663. 663. Mm -hmm. The words he has spoken are spirit and life. They are life. Yeah, yeah. It's that simple. I mean, succinct. You don't have to. Yeah. Well, on the other hand, I like to go back to the, to the Greek crisis when it comes yeah. to judgment because the primary meaning is a separation, not a judicial judgment of sort. It's a separation. So when we say, moreover, the father judges no one, he has entrusted the separation to Jesus, the separation of, from the world into the ways of God. Absolutely. Well, in another, remember John fifteen fifteen, I no longer call you slaves mm -hmm. because everything I taught, excuse me, in the past I called you slaves, but now I'm going to tell you plainly about the Father. What's he doing? He's teaching. Mm -hmm. It's a teaching process. And, uh, he wants to make you friends. I think we do, we do a disservice by letting that word be translated as uh, servants. Mm -hmm. It's slaves. What? Slaves to mm -hmm. sin. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. And it's, 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 you know, servants, well, you know, you do it, but no, it's your slaves to, to, to sin and evil. Does that separation have anything to do when people are separated from his to his right hand versus his left absolutely yes. Matthew 25 so is that is that those judgment who love the truth, right there those who love the truth and those who love the lie mm -hmm. those so, who come to the light those who want to run away from the light the sheep and the goat yeah okay so we're finding well, out who's the sheep and who's the goat think think about Jesus' no. conversations with no. the Pharisees <laughs> it, it's not a matter of separating people it's a matter of separating yeah. the word, mm -hmm. the truth from the untruth that ho the world goes by. Mm -hmm. That's the separation that he, Jesus makes. It, he doesn't separate people. He separates us from the r false knowledge mm -hmm. that is surrounding us. Some people carry us. the wrong word and some people carry the right word? Well, well I'm not saying the people. Uh, we have to go by the word of Jesus. The words I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they lead you to life mm -hmm. that's true but i'm still talking about the separation that's the separation that causes yes the words of christ is what separates yeah, it's that the has truth nothing to do with the people it's the truth that will set you free which means it's the message from christ but it's in terms of the light and the darkness there's still a reaction from the people they of course, it's all on how you accept it. Yes. Right, so they separate themselves in a sense. Or yeah. There's mm -hmm. a separating process. Ultimately, we each judge ourselves by how we respond to the truth. So is Some that people like it. We right. sep we're separating ourselves? Yeah, yes. absolutely. Okay, so yeah. I, I, I keep looking at, see this big judge, judge up on a, on a big, you know, yeah. pillar somewhere saying... Metaphor. Wrong metaphor. Yeah, yeah. No, it yeah. doesn't work like it's that. It's a human metaphor as yeah. opposed to a divine one. Well, the sheep and the goats, he, he does, uh, yeah, Jesus does give that parable. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, he's uh, just pointing out the difference between the two groups. This mm -hmm. group is th does this, and the other one did that. They, that's and and remember, and this, is, this is another part of that same picture. God has not given us the the, the responsibility of judging any other person. We're not to judge them. We do have to be true, we do have to be discerners of what they say. 
It's the same way. How do you respond to the truth? How do you respond to the truth? Those who respond to the truth and love it, they're on God's side. Those who hate the truth and run away from it, they're on Satan's side because that's what he's done all his life. The other picture of the throne uh, judgment is Daniel 7, but mm -hmm. in that case, uh, judgment is, is passed in favor of the saints. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's always a positive kind of thing. There's negative stuff regarding the beast and the, uh, the various yeah. beasts and the uh, ho little horn and such, but uh, in terms of the people of God, it's, it's yeah. pos positive. Well, there in, 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 in John 16, it says, one of the things he will do is to convince us about sin. There are three verses in the Bible that clearly spell out what sin is, define sin in one way or another. The most commonly used one is 1 John 3, 4. In the King James Version, that says, sin is the transgression of the law. Now, that's one of those rare cases in which the King James Version is a very free translation. The Greek is hamartia estin anomia. Sin is rebelliousness or lawlessness. That's it's just three words. Sin is rebelliousness, or if you choose lawlessness or rebelliousness, however you want to translate that particular word. That's the most commonly used verse. Another verse is James 4.17, where it says, basically, and let me just call it up here, we can look at it. So then those who do not do the good they know they should do are guilty of sin. So those are sins of omission. We sometimes talk, talk about sins of commission and sins of omission. So you don't do what you know you're supposed to do, that's sin. But the most, the most basic and I think the most comprehensive uh, definition of sin is found in, in Romans 14, 23. Now, I, w I wish we had time to discuss the whole chapter. It's talking about people offering food, eating food which has been offered to idols and how that might affect us and so forth. But you come down to the end of it. But if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it because their action is not based on faith. And then this is the, the concluding point. And anything that is not based on faith is sin. What does that mean? Anything we do that is not the fruit of our persuasion, faith, mm -hmm. that it's all about love, mm -hmm. produces sin. Okay. I've sometimes pictured it like this. I like your idea. I sometimes picture it like this. If it's something that takes you away from God, it's sin. If it's something that draws you closer to God, it's faith. Love. God is love. Yep. So we're saying the same thing in exactly. effect. Exactly. Exactly. So it's, are we, are we getting closer and closer to God, closer and closer to Jesus, closer and closer to the Holy Spirit's desire for us? Are we moving away from that? Are we, are we becoming more and more selfish like the devil? So John 16 is not focusing on how the Spirit might deal with individual mistakes or transgressions or sins in the plural. It is talking about the basic issue of sin. What's the basic issue of sin? Our Bible study guide puts it in these words. Our deepest misery and alienation consists not in our moral imperfection, but in our estrangement from God and our refusal to accept the one whom God has sent for the purpose of rescuing us from this condition. So if, you, if you're not willing to turn to Jesus, it doesn't matter what else you do. It does not matter what else you're doing if you're not willing to come back to Jesus. But again, estrangement from God is estrangement from, from love. Exactly. Same so, story. Exactly. If you're unwilling to take instruction, what can the God do? So, yeah, if we reject God's offer of help, he says, you know. So, let's look at some things now. What was the mission of Jesus Christ? How is that related to his death on the cross, how is that work related to the work of the Holy Spirit, and finally to our salvation. So we have four things there. How are they related? Well, John uh, eighteen thirty seven came to bear witness to the truth. In other words, demonstrate what, what the truth is about God. You've seen me, say Jesus, you've seen the Father. Now, I'm going to do something which is a little bit strange, will seem a little bit strange to some of you. 
One of the important things that Ellen White has taught us is that the plan of salvation is not just for this little world and a bunch of sinners. It's for the entire universe. The plan of salvation has something important to say to the rest of the universe. <clears throat> so if we have to, if we're going to really understand what the plan of sa salvation is, is for and, and how it impacts us, we need to also think about how it impacts them. Let me read you a few words from her. Through the plan of salvation, a larger purpose is to be wrought out, even then the salvation of man and the redemption of the earth. Through the revelation of the character of God in Christ, the beneficence of the divine government would be manifested before the universe, the charge of Satan refuted, the nature and result of sin, oops, sorry, the nature and result of sin made plain, and the perpetuity of the law fully demonstrated. In other words, could we, is there a way we could describe that in, in a few words, sort of put those all together? God is love. What he says is right. <coughs> Satan is selfishness. What he says is wrong. Okay? Again, but the plan, that was, by the way, that's, uh, that's found in Signs of the Times, February 13, 1893. Uh, it's also in that, the little book, That I May Know Him, page 366. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. So we're trying to enlarge our picture here. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this earth we be, will be, world be cast out. And who is the prince of this world? Satan. Satan. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Now some of you are going to recognize that she left a word out there. What word is left out? It's not there. <laughs> the yeah. word that's not there. <laughs> Some, the King James says all men. The word men is not there in the original. The act of, and by the way, unfortunately, we sometimes, when we, when we quote Ellen White on this, we sometimes try to put the word men back in. So I, I go on. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and results of sin. That one's easier to find. It's in Patriarchs and Prophets 68 and 69. And going on, another past place. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal, to God, reveal God both to men and to angels. Reveal God to angels. I thought the angels lived with God. Not alone for, the, for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look, 1 Peter 1, 12. And I can tell you, I'm happy to tell you, that the lessons coming up our next quarter will be on First and Second Peter. And it will be their study, that's the work of the, the, the study of the angels, throughout endless ages. Desire of Ages, page 19, paragraph 2. And one more, to the angels in the unfallen worlds, the cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. The arch apostate, that would be Satan, had so clothed himself with deception that even the holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. Desire of Ages 758. Paragraph three, and that's in that fantastic chapter entitled It Is Finished. Somehow I missed those quotes in the Bible study guide. I wonder how they got in there. In my study guide. <laughs> no, I put it in here on purpose. So they weren't in the They're not in Sabbath the Bible School study guide, the, 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 the General Conference Bible But they study. are in your handouts. They're in my handout, which is available on our website at Theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. I wonder how many Adventist pastors believe that Jesus' death was important to the sinless angels. 
Now, John let's not get too... Well, so <laughs> I, I had, I had a, a fellow, uh, a pretty famous person, yeah. uh, uh, he says, it's not there, and I quoted him, or had him look up uh, Colossians 1, uh, 19 and 20, and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, and 3, 9 and 10, and he looks at it, and the guy's in, oh, now retired. His father was a, was a radio pastor, yeah. or minister, and his grandfather, and he doesn't under, didn't understand it. All these years, yeah. you know, it's, it's such a, it makes God look so great and gracious and, and under, er, compassionate, and you go through life with, without having that, that beautiful thing. So the Holy Spirit has not been sent to us just to convict us of sin and teach us the truth about sin versus faith, but also to teach us the truth about righteousness. So the, the angels don't need to be taught about forgiveness of sin. They don't need to have their sins forgiven. What do they need to learn? Well, they need to learn about righteousness. How do they learn about righteousness? Romans 3.25 and 26. Yeah. You know, it looked like in the past God just uh, looked over. Remember what it Overlooked says? Overlooked men's former sins, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but remember in, in uh, Jeremiah 10, 11 and uh, Psalms 82, 7, he's talking about this, the evil angels. They're going to die like humans. Mm -hmm. Well, the world is no more aware of the truth about righteousness than it is in the truth about sin. Isaiah 64, 6, and this is one verse that we quote quite often. Maybe I should just put it up on the screen there. All of us have been sinful. Even our best actions are filthy through and through because of our sins. We are like leaves that wither and are blown away by the, by the wind. And the traditional King James, of course, says all our righteousness are as filthy rags. But if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, revealing to us the truth of all that Jesus taught and did, we can become like Him in character. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We don't, be, we don't do that ourselves. The Holy Spirit can do that in us, accepting the righteousness of Jesus Christ on our behalf. So is the Father the one who has to prove of our righteousness before we can enter heaven? Or does that mean the Father is not as loving as, as, as the Son? Well, well, what did he say in John uh, seventeen thirty one? He'd eternal life is to know the Father and, and Jesus Christ to him say he is sent. And in John, John 6... John 17, 3. three. Did, what did yeah, I say? 31. 31. I'm sorry, yeah, 17, 3. And then uh, John 6, he says, uh, eat my flesh, drink my blood, and I'll raise you in the last day. Mm -hmm. And there's some other texts there that... It, you know, it doesn't say, well, providing you to do this, and uh, a checklist. and Well, there's two, in, in this matter of the judgment, there's two or three verses that we need to look at real quickly. John 5, verse 22. Nor does the Father himself judge anyone. He has given his Son the full right to judge. And then if we drop back to John 3, 17 to 21, it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light to be shown up, but those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. And basically, John 12, 47 to 48 says about the same th thing. Anyone who hears my message and does not obey it, I will not judge him. I came not to judge the world, but to save it. Those who reject me and do not accept my message have one who will judge them. The words I have spoken will be their judge on the last day. So each one of us re judges ourselves by the way we respond to the truth. The words are going to be at a judge and they go and then jump over to John uh, 6, 63. Yeah. The words are spirit and life. Yeah. What, how can we not re connect, connect those dots. things in, in this important subject we're ta talking about? Romans 5, verse 10. We, we were God's enemies, but he made us his friends through the death of his son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will we be saved by Christ's life? So, what is God trying to do here? He says, I want to be your friend. I want to be your friend. He's trying to bring at one in his universe. Yeah. 
that's what it's all about from the time he, be, he decided to create is to have everything be in harmony, which is a state of at one But unfortunately, about 400 years ago, thereabouts, 500, they used atonement and paying a penalty or doing some ritual to, to win God's favor. Well, we had a bunch of, you know, no aspersions here, but we had a bunch of lawyers who started the Reformation, ah. and they talked about salvation in legal terms. Well, you know, there's another thing about loving a lie. Mm -hmm. When people love lies, life doesn't go very well for them. Yeah. And life becomes kind of a fire, kind of, kind of something that's not worth living. And I think there's a, there's a, a line there to think about as far as the second death coming. Yeah. Okay. Well, God is basically, go ahead. Even though the reformers were lawyers and had some hang-ups, they gave us great, great steps forward also. Right. Absolutely. And let's not belittle that at all. Well, God is saying, welcome to heaven, but I, I'm not going to have any jails in heaven. I'm not going to have police on every corner. So I can only admit to heaven people who are safe to have there. People who are willing to live and want to be there. They want, uh, Ellen White says that if, if Jesus, if God admitted to Satan, admitted Satan to heaven, it would be pure torture for him. Because he's so contrary, his whole nature is so contrary to the love and the, so forth of that uh, God. And then why does he have to keep him out if he, he doesn't, doesn't want to be there? Well, anyway. Satan keeps himself out. Yeah. God doesn't keep him out. Okay. Okay. And ultimately, the, his ilk will destroy themselves. Yeah. All those who want to be out of the kingdom of heaven will be out. All those who want to be in the kingdom of heaven will be in. Yeah, you know, honors your choice. Well, it just started out that God is not going to allow these people in. No. But it, it isn't like he doesn't allow them to come in. They don't want to come in anyway. That's right. right. Yeah. That's well, so by decisively refuting the accusations and answering the questions that have been raised by Satan and the great controversy, Jesus was able to return to his Father triumphantly, having won the great controversy and providing salvation for the entire universe. Well, and let's, let's quote again uh, Colossians 1, 19 and 20 and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. He brought peace to the beings in the heavenly places as well as the beings on this earth. Yeah. Many Christians believe that we can only be saved because there's saints and there's Mary and there's the Holy Spirit and there's Jesus and they're all pleading with the Father. In fact, they're actually placing their merits on our behalf so that we can somehow or other look better than we really are. Does God admit people to heaven that under false pretenses? No. No. Is God blind when we come in? No. Well, what you're saying is that that whole effort is meaningless. Which whole effort? Yeah. To, well, to, it just be, is. to, to beg God yeah. to let us in. Well, that's John 1 13. God cannot be, t God tempts no one and he cannot be tempted. God never changes. Mm -hmm. okay? I mean, tempted means you have to do, you have to do something to change God's mind. Yeah. No. He, he, all, he wants you to. It woo you, we, we say, to win you over, to uh, one you, to bring to, you to in a state of harmony, uh, at uh, one moment. But if you re re reject it, what can he do? Our Bible study guide says that God raised Jesus from the dead and thus placed a stamp of approval on what Jesus did. But that's not quite what Jesus said. Uh, here's Ellen White quoting two verses from the Bible. Listen to these words. When the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb, saying, Thy Father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. Now was proved the, word, the truth of his words, I lay down my life that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and rulers, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. That's Desire of Ages, 785, paragraph 2. So this is a major point. Remember, Satan had claimed back in the beginning that he, he was standing on one side of God's throne and Jesus was standing on the other side of God's throne and, and therefore he should be treated the same as Jesus was being treated. And God says, no, you're, you're not God. Jesus is. 
And, and, and Satan tried to say, no, that's not true. I'm the same as Jesus. Well, Jesus proves that he's not the same as Satan by raising himself from the dead. Let's see Satan try doing that. I'd love to see him try doing that. Well, uh, let's see Satan try to die on the cross, too. Because yeah. he isn't that type of person that would yeah. do that for anybody. So, we have said now that what Jesus did, he did for our salvation, but not just for our salvation, he did it for the benefit of the entire universe. How do we, how do we bring that all together? If it's the focus of our lives to come to be more like Jesus, so that we can correctly represent God while we're still here on this earth, what does that do for God? And Jim, uh, we don't have time to go there now, Jim has quoted already, Colossians 1, 19 and 20, uh, Ephesians 3, 7 to 10, and Ephesians 1. And there it says, the church is supposed to teach the angels something about God. What could we possibly teach the angels about God? Well, we, all finite beings need to be led because we don't have the foresight to go into infinity like my mm -hmm. like God can. So if you think about the angels, even they are finite, even though they're, they may be big, bigger and grander than us, mm -hmm. they're still finite, they still need to be led. Mm -hmm. And when they watch us down here, not being led, they learn something about themselves also. That's how I see it. Yeah, they, and they learn incredible things about God by seeing how he deals with rebels. Do I dare uh, throw out a thought? Okay, please. <laughs> the angels don't know what death is. Yeah. Satan, who was the first one to sin, has not died yet. Mm -hmm. Humans are the first ones who died. Mm -hmm. Therefore, none of the angels could have the wherewithal that love should be more important to us than our own life. If nothing else, Jesus came to show the universe mm -hmm. that love is more important than life and that if you have love in your heart when you die, guess what happens? You're going to be resurrected. That's right. Yeah. Well, we've talked about this before um, and, and I don't know how to say it any clearer than we've said it in the past. Jesus came to tell us the truth. We fell apart in the Garden of Eden because we accepted lies. So now here's the, here's, here's, the, here's the thing. Do we want the truth or do we want lies? Are we willing to accept Satan's ideas about things or we, we, are we, are we, we want God's ideas about things? Do we want selfishness or do we want truth? I, I mean love, I'm sorry. Our main approach to sinners is sometimes um, we're going to scare them. And I, you know, I sometimes jokingly say, you can't scare the hell out of people. Mm -hmm. And I mean that literally, you know, you, it just doesn't work. So, um, that's me. <laughs> do we need, to, we need to speak the truth about sin and its terrible consequences. I mean, death is its consequence. And the three angels' message, the last and final message of God, I mean, that's the scariest language in the whole Bible. Sometimes we have to scare people, but you can't scare hell out of them. You have to say, okay, they have to see what a problem that is, and then they have to recognize the truth for themselves. In Proverbs, it says if we, yeah. persist, <coughs> if we persist in our rebellion, he will send a cruel messenger against us. Mm -hmm. So if the usual methods don't work. He tries to get our attention another way. Yeah. That's what I mean by discipline. Mm -hmm. Cruel is, is a discipline. So. Well... Do we really believe that Jesus has already won the great controversy? Yes. Do we really want to join his side or do we want to stay on Satan's side? See, that's the question. Is the great controversy won when Jesus shows the universe that love is more important than life? Or is it won when he has followers who end up believing the same way? Okay, and that's a very good point. S Satan had claimed that no human being could ever live a sinless life. Jesus did it. 
And now what is Satan left with? He says, well, okay, fine. You lived a sinless life, but you will never find a group of people who will really follow you, as you just suggested, follow you to the letter and no, they, they, they have been sinners in the past, but now they're absolutely committed to you. He says, every human being, if given a chance, will be selfish. And God says, no, at the very worst time in human history, at the very end, there's going to be a whole group of people who are so committed to me that you will not be able to get them to sin no matter what you do to them. And Satan says, no, that'll never happen. Well, just wait. Why, do we, why does the devil go around in our day like a roaring lion? He's an Adventist, right? <laughs> Not an Adventist with a capital A, an Adventist with a little a. I think the devil knows more about how serious, uh, serious a time is in which we live than we do. You tell somebody that Satan is an Adventist. <laughs> <laughs> that there will be a disconnect if <laughs> it's almost breachable. Well... John 8, 32 says something very interesting that we need to look at. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now our Bible study guide says, well, that's because the blood of Jesus sets us free. Is that what happened? Was there something about his red blood cells or his white blood cells or the platelets or the plasma that was different? Well, that has a lot, a lot of interpretation of, of the text that is not written that way. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. I mean, why in the world? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, well, First uh, Corinthians one uh, eighteen. Uh, we really need to be reminded that uh, the reason Jesus came was to bring us the truth. Yeah. And what is the truth? It's the message of the cross, as First Corinthians one eighteen would put it. And that message is the truth. Therefore, there is truth thanks to the blood He was willing to shed. <laughs> so, in that sense, the blood, yes provides us with the elements of the truth we need. Love is more important in my life. Therefore, I'm willing to have the shedding of my blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in, in line with that, this is the paragraph I put in my words. Or is it the meaning of the death of Jesus that teaches us the truth about sin and its consequences, which are death? And this we're, we're not talking about the death of heart attacks and strokes and things like that. We're talking about the second death, the death which is, would normally be eternal, it is eternal for anybody who's not divine and demonstrates once and for all that it is God who has told us the truth. As World War II was drawing to a conclusion, Hitler realized he was losing. He redoubled his efforts so that the last months of World War II were the bloodiest times of all. No wonder we need to be very aware of Satan's conditions and his goals in life. The real judgment came when Jesus decisively defeated the devil at the cross and at the tomb of Joseph. There can be no doubt among those with, with a clear understanding of the great controversy about who has been telling us the truth ever since the Garden of Eden and telling the truth to the rest of the universe ever since even before that. So, what are those issues? Well, now let's, let's apply what we've been saying to the so-called assurance of salvation. Look at a few verses. 1 John 5, 12 and 13. Whoever has the Son has this life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I am writing this to you so that you may know that you have eternal life, you that believe in the Son of God. So, basically what he's saying is <coughs> Jesus has already won the great controversy. If you're on his side, you're on the winning side, okay? Let's try another couple of verses. Romans 8, 15 to 17. For the Spirit that God has given you does not make you slaves and cause you to be afraid. Instead, the Spirit makes you God's children. And by the Spirit's power, we cry out to God, Father, my Father. God's Spirit joins itself to our spirits to declare that we are God's children. Since we are His children, we will possess the blessings He keeps for His people, and we will also possess with Christ what God has kept for him. For if we share Christ's suffering, we will also share his glory. Um, and 2 Corinthians 5, 5 is a good one too. God is the one who has prepared us for this, cha this change, and he gave us his spirit as the guarantee of all that he has in store for us. How is the Holy Spirit a guarantee? Any 
Anybody? Does he? He's a tie to God. Does he have? Does he have any? Any problem in doing what he wants to do? I mean, is there any limitation on God's side? Maybe I should put it that way, and accomplish what needs to be done. So where's the limitation? It's in me, right? The only limitation is in me. So if I turn to God and I say, yes, I want this. I want to be more like Jesus. I want his salvation. And the Holy Spirit comes into my life. I have a guarantee of salvation. Romans 5.10, what does he do? He changes us from enemies into his friends. Look at Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And you also become God's people when you heard, became God's people when you heard the me true message, the good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ and God put his stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit he had promised. That would be his seal. The Spirit is a guarantee that we shall receive what God has promised in his people and, the and this assures us that God will give us, give complete freedom to those who are his. Let us praise his glory. You mentioned Romans 5.10. Mm -hmm. Eternal life, excuse me, his came to, his, excuse me, his life. Oh, oh, my brain. We're saved by his life. Yeah, we're saved by his life. Yeah. In other words, we need to, or healed. Mm -hmm. Substitute the word healed. Yeah. We are healed by his life. Study his life, mm -hmm. and, more, and that is in harmony with uh, John, uh, excuse me, John 17.3 and John 6. Yeah. Well, Ellen White puts it these ways to let us understand that sealing, that stamp of God's approval. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, this is where we do our thinking, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth. We, we rejected Satan's lies. We've accepted God's truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has begun already. This is SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4, pages 1161, paragraph 6. Christians should not be speaking as if their salvation was in doubt. Christ has already won the great controversy, great controversy and Ellen White once again says, <clears throat> Talk courage, talk faith and hope, and you will be all light in the Lord. Keep thinking of the open door that Christ has set before you that no man can shut. God will close the door to all evil if you will give him a chance. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up for you a standard against him. Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, April 16, 1889. What? Okay. Now, so can we try pulling all these things together? What's the, the relationship here between the Holy Spirit, the love of God, the hope? God's entire government is based on love. God himself is described as love. Fred has repeated that many times already. As we look forward to being a part of that government, we can have the greatest hope possible. In fact, we can face whatever might come because we know that even if we were to be martyred, we would have an eternal hope and a future life. It, is, it was that realization, that hope, that transformed the disciples after Resurrection Sunday. I, always, I just love to read Acts 4. Peter, who, you know, that woman pointed a finger at him, and, oh, yeah, no, I don't even know this man, you know. And then a, a little while later, he's standing in front of the entire Sanhedrin. That's a, that was the Congress of his day. Say, you are the ones who killed Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah that you proclaim, that you say you're playing. I mean, what a change. Well, in summary, we can say with absolute certainty that the Holy Spirit works harmoniously with God and the, God the Father and God the Son to accomplish our salvation. Everything that is required for our salvation is possible through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. The evidence has been laid out in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The Holy Spirit helps us to comprehend the incredible implications of those facts. Now, can you think of any accusation that Satan has made or any question he's raised that was not answered by the life and death of Jesus? There aren't any. I, maybe with the exception that I mentioned a little earlier, Satan says, well, God, you can never get a group of human beings to live the way you lived here on this earth. And God says, just, just wait. I'll show you. Two thousand years. A couple thousand years. Might have to wait a while. 
Well, here's Ellen White's incredible comments on that, and this is found in, in the Desire of Ages, um, page 671, paragraphs 2 and 3. In describing to his disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit, this is our summary, Jesus sought to inspire them with the joy and hope that inspired his own heart. So here he is facing crucifixion, facing torture, facing crucifixion. He knows what's coming. But he's inspiring his disciples with joy and hope. He rejoiced because of the abundant help he had provided for his church. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent. And without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only to the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. What does that mean? That means we can't save ourselves. There's nothing we can do by ourselves or for ourselves that's going to make us, you know, who transform us to be like Jesus Christ. The only way that happens is if we say, Holy Spirit, come in. I give you opportunity by reading my Bible, by studying, by praying. I want to be more like Jesus. And the Holy Spirit says, okay, if that's what you really want, I can do that for you. It is the Spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. It is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. We can become partakers of the divine nature. Christ has given His Spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil. Now, some people will tell us, well, no, I was just born that way. Other people say, well, no, I have bad habits. No, the Holy Spirit will help you overcome all those things and to impress His own character upon His church. Of the Spirit, Jesus said, He shall glorify Me. The Savior came. I'm still reading from Desire of Ages. The Savior came to glorify the Father by the demonstration of His love. So the Spirit was to glorify Christ by revealing His grace to the world. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of His people. Can, you, can we even comprehend that idea that God's honor depends on our response to the Holy Spirit and his allowing us allowing our allowing him to change us to transform us to speak the truth about him to love as he loved you know to live lives like Jesus that's that's God's goal for you it's God's goal for us so do you feel comfortable in this presentation of the truth about sin and the truth about righteousness do you understand the implications of Romans 14, 23? Faith brings us closer to God. Sin leads us away from God. Oh, or, yeah. Do we understand what the assurance of salvation is based upon? Look at these two facts. One, Jesus Christ has already won the great controversy on behalf of God and the entire universe. Two, if we are willing to take the time to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to transform us into God's faithful and obedient children, God has promised us an eternity of wonderful times with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and all the rest of His children throughout the universe. Well, so have you considered the fact that there seems to be a biblical difference between talking about sin in the singular and sins in the plural? Sins in the plural are the mistakes we make every day, the, the, the selfishness, the, I don't know, covetousness, whatever it might be involved. Sin, the one sin that really matters, that leads to all those other things, is our separation from God, separation from the Father, separation from Jesus Christ. That's sin in the singular. That's the basic sin. During these lessons, we have, have you developed a better understanding of the ministry of the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit's ultimate goal for our lives? 
The Holy Spirit wants us to develop an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Why do you think in Revelation the church is called the Bride of Christ? He wants us to recognize that sin separates us from God, from life, and from any future hope. But he also wants us to re understand that all of that, can be put be all of that can be put behind us as we develop a correct relationship with Jesus Christ. So why did Jesus say that he would be closer, we would be closer, he would be closer to us if he went away than if he stayed here on this earth? At all times and in all places, in all sorrows and in all afflictions, when the outlook seems dark and the future perplexing, and we feel helpless and alone, the Comforter will be sent in answer to the prayer of faith. Circumstances may separate us from, our, from every earthly friend, but no circumstance, no distance can separate us from the heavenly comforter. Wherever we are, wherever we may go, he is always at our right hand to support, sustain, uphold, and cheer. And once again, that's Desire of Ages. This case, it's this, this time it's page 669 to 670. So trying to imagine yourself back among the disciples of Jesus at the crucifixion, how would you feel? Then on Sunday, he's raised from the dead. How would you respond? The women come and say, hey, he's gone. He's, he's raised. Ah, oh, come on. Where did you get, you know, <laughs> you just can't, it doesn't compute. Then try to imagine how you would feel seven weeks later. You've gotten together with the other disciples. You've put aside all your differences. And then the Holy Spirit comes down. And you see this unbelievable... I mean, you've, you've lived with Jesus now for years. And you've seen this arguments. And you've seen his fighting with the Pharisees. And you've seen all the enemies gathered against him. And all of a sudden, you get up and you, you, you pray a, a fairly simple sermon. And 3,000 people want to be baptized? What happened? Well, that's, a trans that's the kind of transportation that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our year, in our time. And you can be a part of it, and I can be a part of it. We can, be, we can have that kind of experience that the disciples had there at Pentecost. Let's pray for it. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have been working our way through these lessons on the Holy Spirit. We hope that in our struggles to understand things, we have come to a better understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit, a better understanding of your, your relationship with your Son and the incredible promise He made in John 17 that we could have the kind of relationship with Him that He had with you. That's just hard for us to even imagine. But we have given the, been given the privilege of welcoming the Holy Spirit into our lives, of claiming his transforming power so that we may be among those people who will stand one day and look up and see that small black cloud coming and then realizing that that black cloud is turning into a brilliant white cloud and there seated on his throne is Jesus Christ. May we have the privilege of seeing that as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.